Hello and welcome to episode 3 of Disparate Post Ireland, coming to you from the fair city of Dublin. I am your host, Frank Lennon. Otto von Bismarck, Chancellor in the Germany of the 1800s, told us, Politics is the art of the possible, the attainable, the art of the next best. So, with Bismarck's words in mind, let us now take a look at some Irish political issues through the lens of Irish politics and politics. Part 1 We commence our journey with a question. What had these gentlemen got in common? On the left we have Declan Costello, 1926-2011, and on the right Tom Higgins, 1916-2003. Well, the first commonality was both were Irish politicians whose political views were expressed from inside the fold of the Fine Gael party. The second commonality was both were reformists who apparently had a strong and motivating sense of social justice. The latter commonality was of course expressed in the emergence during the early to mid 1960s of the Towards a Just Society political policy document, authored by Declan Costello. This Just Society policy was referenced and supported during no less than two presidential campaigns by Tom O'Higgins, who on each occasion was also a candidate for the presidency. I am convinced if Declan Costello was still with us and involved in politics today, he would be among the key members of the Irish Social Democrats. Declan Costello believed that working towards a just society was what Ireland needed. He believed in crafting an Ireland based on social justice and equality of opportunity. He saw poverty, unemployment and emigration as unacceptable, and he worked tirelessly in developing an eight-point plan, which later was to become the policy document towards a just society, which was published in 1965. Some key elements of just society policy were economic planning, that is, a ministry for economic affairs, government control of bank credit policy, investment by government in industry, price controls, an increase in social capital investments, and indirect, not direct taxations. These were some of his words uttered during promotion of the Towards a Just Society concept. Too many people are unemployed and forced to emigrate. Too many are employed on miserably low wages and salaries. Too many have only a small income or pension. Many survive on a bare subsistence from, for example, a small farm. Many are kept just above starvation level, but not more, by the inadequate social welfare payments they receive. Many live in squalor and in appalling overcrowded conditions. Declan Costello believed that a re-evaluation of the role of the state and its duty towards its citizens was required. Such a re-evaluation remains as required today as it did at its time of first consideration by Declan Costello all of 52 years ago. That such should remain the case is poignantly telling. And so, the gauntlet of crafting a just society was picked up enthusiastically by Fine Gael, and we've lived happily ever since. Well, no, not quite the fairy tale ending. In fact, Declan Costello's grand vision of a just society did not go down very well with many members of the Fine Gael party, none the least of which was one of their former leaders during the era in which the Just Society policy was formulated, one James Dillon. 
Mr. Dillon is on record as having emphatically stated, We shall rely on private enterprise. We are a private enterprise party. So there it was, straight from the horse's mouth. We are a private enterprise party. And by extension, in my words here, do not support the just society policy. Disappointing? Well, yes. In my humble opinion, coming from an individual whose salary and pension would be paid for totally by the people, that is, a public servant, such an utterance was arrogant, selfish, and to say the very least, disappointing. Following the virtual wipeout of Fianna Fáil at the polls in 2011, Fine Gael was swept into power. Fine Gael, despite doing well at the polls, which incidentally was a massive protest vote against Fianna Fáil, nonetheless did not have the numbers to form a single party government. Fine Gael therefore entered negotiations with the Irish Labour Party and the coalition government eventually ensued. Many who voted for the Irish Labour Party in 2011 believed that their claimed social ethos would act as a bulwark against any likely excesses from Fine Gael, a right-wing corporatist party. Such belief proved ill-founded and heralded crushing disappointment for Labour supporters and ultimately a virtual wipeout for the Labour Party in the Irish general election of 2016. Although perhaps not comprehensive, what is displayed is a summary of the swinging cuts and new taxes brought in by the Fine Gael Labour government of 2011-2016. Fuel allowance scheme cut from 32 to 26 weeks. Fuel allowance cut by 25%. Rent allowance cut. Clothing and footwear allowance cut. Disability allowance entitlement age raised to 18. Disability allowance rates cut for over 18s. Carers allowance cut. Telephone allowance axed completely. One parent family benefit cut for children over 7. Child benefit cut at least three times under Phila Gale and Labour. Six times in total. Illness benefit qualifying period raised to six days from three days. Invalidity pension cut. Bereavement grant axed completely. USC charge imposed. VAT raised. College fees raised. Unemployment benefit for under 25s cut in half. 80,000 people emigrating per year. Medical cards taken off the sick, elderly and terminally ill. Insurance levy imposed. Local property tax introduced. Water tax introduced. Local services starved of funding. The LPT proceeds were donated instead to the starving banks. Gift card tax sneaked in quietly. And of course, to kind of round all that off, nepotism and cronyism uh, was still persisting big time under Fine Gael and Labour. And since we have just heard mention of the starving banks, the additional great news for the average Irish person was citizens of Ireland had been forced by the EU corporate empire under a metaphorical threat of a bomb going off in Dublin if bondholders were burnt to pay more than any other nation to a failed banking system. 64 billion euros to be precise or 13,956 euros on average per person. Charles Darwin 1809-1882 one of the greatest luminaries of the 19th century cautions us as follows if the misery of the poor be caused not by the laws of nature but by our own institutions great is our sin ah yes the misery of our poor there has indeed been much misery for many in ireland since 2007 2008 in the past when some of us heard the term poor we imagined down and out penniless people shuffling along our streets in rags 
Yes, such images were once valid. They certainly applied in famine times, and indeed in the 19th and early 20th century slum areas of Dublin. The misery as referenced by Charles Darwin is with us again. It is with us in the form of the economic tyranny of austerity visited upon us by our so-called institutions. We see the public face of such misery in the form of unfortunate homeless people huddled in sleeping bags and lying on cardboard in the doorways of city buildings. We see it in the queues of homeless people at charitable public soup kitchens and public sandwich stands. In addition, today, however, we have a new poor, poor which we cannot see, a poor who each day blend among us on our streets. Reasonably well dressed and seemingly purposeful in going about their business as we pass each other each day, the new poor suffer in silence and virtual invisibility. Many of the new poor may not be homeless, but the loss of their home may be imminent, are locked into an irreversible process of ultimate loss, as the so-called institutions step in for what they believe to be their pound of flesh. Family homes in Ireland exist in a market. They are considered to be a commodity, something to be bought and sold for a profit. It follows then that family homes are continually vulnerable to the vagarities of a supply and demand Wild West market, a market which takes no account of the true purpose of a family home and indeed cares less. I believe that in any just society a family home should be inviolable. It should never be exposed to threat from any profit-seeking individual or group. The family home should indeed be legislatively protected from such threats. In December 2016, Ed Carty of the Irish Mirror reported that more than four family homes a day were being repossessed in Ireland and that 34,551 mortgages on family homes were behind with repayments by two years or more. Carthy goes on to say that data since 2010 showed that Irish banks, as Charles Darwin might suggest, our institutions, had repossessed more than 7,500 homes and apartments. Non-bank entities, aka vulture funds most likely, now control 45,638 mortgages in Ireland, almost 15,000 of which are held by unregulated loan owners. 38% of mortgages in the latter category being in arrears of over 720 days. In an early 2016 article in the journal, Keenan Brennan states as follows, and I quote, With the homeless rate in Ireland similarly booming in recent times, Pat Doyle, CEO of the Peter McVerry Trust, has expressed his concern that the spiralling rates of repossessions would be set to make the homeless figures even worse." Unquote. What follows is an abstract from a piece entitled How Do We Prevent Mass Repossessions of Family Homes? authored by David Hall and published on the Irish Mortgage Holders Association website. And I quote, There are a few categories of people who are at risk. Those who have a minor glitch and with some help will resolve their issue. Those who have significant debts, both secured and unsecured, and who will need an insolvency arrangement. Finally, there is then a category of people who have been abandoned by the system. The 37,484 people in mortgage arrears of more than two years. This category presents a clear and present danger to the social housing and political system, along with the families themselves. It is further exacerbated by another 21,881 who are in arrears of more than one year. By any reasonable analysis, this leaves a minimum of 25,000 families in line for repossession of their family home." Unquote. Staggering stuff indeed. If we assume that each family unit comprises four individuals, we are talking about 100,000 people's lives being thrown into chaos, or put another way, the entire city of Limerick, plus
plus an additional 10,000 people losing their homes. In light of all of this, one simply must ask the question, why has LPT local property tax, or to give it its proper title, in the context of what we're discussing, family home tax, remained the obvious burden and indiscriminate imposition which it has vis-a-vis -vis the family home. Surely, given the obvious and massive threat of mortgage difficulty and continued homelessness, if we were a just society, we would already be alert to the fact of family home tax being a removable burden, which it is, and immediately take steps to alleviate that burden. In recent weeks, sinister urgings have been emanating from within the EU corporate empire directed towards Ireland and suggesting that we should be increasing LPT property tax. In my opinion, to attempt to comply with such a demand, particularly at this time, would be madness cubed and would simply be pouring more fuel onto an already raging fire. Yes, family home tax aka LPT property tax should indeed be revisited but exclusively with a view to ideally removing it entirely from family homes. We will consider many valid reasons why LPT property tax should be removed from family homes next. Prior to the Irish Labour Party, in coalition with Fine Gael, taking up office in 2011, the Fianna Fáil Party had introduced a selection of swinging taxation measures one of which was ultimately to become known as LPT, Local Property Tax. The Fianna Fáil inspired draconian taxes were prompted by the international banking collapse of 2007-2008 and an accompanying collapse in the Irish building industry. The Labour Fine Gael coalition, however, while under the thumb of the so-called Troika, warmly embraced the inherited suite of Fianna Fáil draconian taxes and during their term in government 2011-2016 as we have already seen added additionally to the nation's taxation pain. From the outset I have been describing family home tax aka local property tax as an unjust, unfair, indiscriminate, anti-family and immoral imposition. I still hold strongly to that viewpoint. LPT property tax, first introduced in July 2013, is the modern incarnation of an abolished taxation of many years ago which used to be known as domestic rates. Domestic rates was a hated taxation which was demanded from householders in what was called two moieties, that is, payments every six months. It only ever went in one direction, i.e. upward. There was constant pressure on local councillors and TDs of all hues, and rightly so in my opinion, to abolish domestic rates, family home tax. Ultimately, in 1977, after a long campaign for their removal, and with the full support of all political parties, general domestic rates were finally scrapped. The loss of taxation revenue by the abolition of general domestic rates was immediately compensated for by increases in both income tax and in value-added tax. No doubt, despite currently being burdened by LPT property tax, we likely still have those domestic rate loss compensation increases in income tax and VAT embedded deep within our bloated taxation structure. Just before we take a look at the many reasons why LPT property tax needs to be looked at again and measures urgently taken to mitigate its worst effects, we should consider these three things. Number one, I would lay a safe bet on the fact that no Irish person on the average wage or less was part of the committee of government advisers who came up with the structure of the LPT property tax scheme. Number two, 
I would also lay a safe bet that those who were on the advisory committee who authored the LPT property tax scheme and recommended it to government were all on high five and six-figure salaries and had gold-plated pensions waiting in the wings. Such individuals, of course, could easily afford what they were likely to recommend. And number three, incredibly, there was all of ten minutes debate in connection with LPT property tax in Dáil Éireann before the government of the day used its guillotine and rammed the legislation through. So, having considered all of that, we now move on and take a look at the many reasons why, in the context of a just society, LPT property tax must be looked at again with a view to its removal from family homes. Reason 1. Homeowners, mortgage holders, have already paid out large stamp duty taxes and VAT on building materials. No less a person than Tom Parlin, Director General of the Irish Construction Industry Federation, is on record as confirming, before purchasers get the keys to their home, 40% of the purchase price of the new home goes straight to the government in the form of tax. Think about that now for a moment. By far the vast majority of ordinary people have to take out mortgages to cover the bulk of the cost of their new home. Typically mortgage repayments, that is interest and capital, are spread over 25 to 30 years. Say, for example, your new home has cost you €400,000. According to Tom Parlin, 40% of that cost, or €160,000, has gone up front to the government in taxes and duties. You had to borrow that 160000 tax amount as part of your general mortgage. So for the next 25 to 30 years, you will be paying interest on that taxation amount. And, in addition, since 2013, family home tax, a.k.a. LPT property tax. Could that be considered just? I don't think so. Reason 2. Family home tax introduces financial instability and undermines many purchasers' ability to service their mortgage. In these times of race to the bottom and technological unemployment in the world of work, of rampant banksterism and vulturism in the family home so-called market, reason too is actually a no-brainer. In the face of what I have outlined, is it just or fair that mortgage holders should be additionally burdened with the likes of LPT property tax? I don't think so. Reason 3. Family home tax does not take into account if the income of the homeowner or mortgage holder is large enough to service the additional tax burden. Lack of any relativity between the amounts of tax which must by law be paid, that is, based on the vagarities of a Wild West property market, and the income of the parties who may be liable, leave for many an unbridgeable financial chasm. Could this be considered just? I very much doubt it. Reason 4. Family home tax is wrong because it exposes families to the vagary of our so-called Wild West property market. A family home is a family's refuge and should never be under such a sword of Damocles. The family home owner, mortgage holder, has absolutely no control over the activities of any market, let alone the so-called property market, and as such cannot take any action to ensure that the so-called market value of their home is maintained within an affordable LPT property tax band. Is this fair or just? Neither. Reason 5. Because of higher property values in selected parts of the country, under family home tax, some home owners 
mortgage holders, will suffer discrimination through higher tax assessments. Indeed, like size homes being treated differently simply because of geographic location. Is this fair? You bet it isn't. Reason 6. Family home tax discourages home ownership, thus placing a financial burden on the state to provide social housing, that is, generating a requirement for even more taxation. So in this context, LPT or property tax should be seen as an unintelligent tax which discourages people from taking responsibility for home ownership and maintenance and contributes to the creation of greater need for social housing, together with whatever additional cost implications such will likely hold for the state. Would this fit neatly into a just society paradigm? I wouldn't imagine so. Reason 7. Family home tax does not help relieve the burden of taxation on income. The reverse is actually the case. Much play was continuously made by the Labour Fine Gael government of 2011-2016 that they would not increase income tax. However, I would pose the following very simple question. For the vast majority of people who, since 2013, have been charged an annual LPT property tax. Where are the financial resources which must be used to pay that tax likely to come from? In the case of those who are lucky enough to be employed, their LPT property tax must either come from direct income or from savings. In the case of the vast majority of retired people on modest pensions, who must pay LPT property tax. Their source of funding that tax can only be their pension or savings if they are lucky enough to have savings. So, hallmark of a just society? In no way is it that. Reason 8. Mortgage providers typically take possession of the deeds of any home purchased and will likely foreclose if the mortgage becomes distressed, that is, a lien on the property. Why then were they not called upon to share the burden of the family home tax? In the eyes of modern mortgage providers, family homes are first and foremost any of the following. A house, a property, a tangible asset, in signing mortgage agreements, mortgage holders are signing promissory notes. These promissory notes are then used by financial institutions to create fiat money, literally out of nothing. Mortgage amounts loaned are simply numbers created by these institutions on computers. Not one cent of anyone else's money is recycled out to mortgage holders as mortgage loans. So, in the creation of the so-called money or credit to facilitate mortgages, promissory notes, no saver is put at any financial risk of any kind, nor does the financial institution issuing the so-called mortgage money use one cent from their own resources. However, the mortgage holder must pay back the money created from nothing over a 25 to 30 year period with interest on penalty of losing their home should they, for whatever valid reason, find themselves unable to adhere to the absolute letter of the mortgage promissory note. Incredibly this, my dear viewers, has been called moral hazard by both the financial institutions and their avid supporters in national administrations. Would you consider all of the foregoing to be fair? Would you consider that it fits neatly into the concept of a just society? In my humble opinion, not a snowball's chance in hell would the foregoing 
even come close. Reason 9. Family home tax takes no account of the level of mortgage which remains outstanding on a family home. So, we have many lucky people out there whose mortgages are paid off and who only have a basic LPT property tax, burden nonetheless, to deal with. However, for every person in the mortgage paid off category, there are many more whose mortgages remain significant financial burdens. And many of those mortgages are, as we are all now too well aware, in financial distress. Those in the latter categories experience indiscriminate LPT property tax as an unjust and unwarranted augmentation of those burdens. Is this situation a fair one? Should it be tolerated in a just society? Highly unlikely that such would ever be tolerated in any just society. Reason 10. Direct taxation of family homes is particularly inappropriate in an era of austerity when so many people are unemployed. In January 2017, the most up-to-date figures available from the Central Statistics Office indicate that we still have 146,200 people unemployed. Our youth unemployment rate as of April 2017 stood at 12,000. Ireland's current gross minimum actual weekly wage stands at 360 euros. In 2016 it was determined that a living wage should be 11 euros 50 per hour. In this era of race to the bottom and zero hours contracts, for those lucky enough to be on a living wage and on a 40 hour week, their gross weekly income should be 460 euros. Immediately we note that the 360 euros current actual minimum wage in Ireland, as confirmed by the Central Statistics Office, falls 100 euros or 22% short of the living wage of 460 euros. The official minimum wage in Ireland at present is 9 euros 25 cent per hour. Again, if you're lucky enough to be on a 40 hour week while on the full minimum wage, you would have a gross weekly income of 370 euros. However, we have already seen that the actual minimum wage being paid is 360 euros. So many people, the new poor, perhaps many of which visit the food kitchens which have sprung up in our midst, are struggling with their families to try and exist on a gross weekly income of less than Ireland's official minimum wage. In the face of all of this, could indiscriminate family home tax a.k.a. LPT property tax, be seen as reasonable and just. Would it tick a yes box in a just society questionnaire? Are you kidding? Reason 11. Family home tax was simply a political choice. It did not have to be. There were, and are, taxation alternatives. We have often heard the term low-hanging fruit. In the wild, low-hanging fruit is very vulnerable, as browsing animals have easy access to it. In the context of family home tax, we might compare family home owners, mortgage holders, to low-hanging fruit, especially those who prudentially took all aspects of their financial affairs into account prior to committing to a home purchase, and who may in July 2013 have been anywhere along their 25 to 30 year mortgage repayment timeline. Such individuals suddenly found that their past prudentiality and current family security had suddenly been undermined by the state in the form of an indiscriminate imposition 
of an undermining universal financial charge, identified as LPT property tax. Such action by the state seems to me to have run contrary to the provisions of Article 41.1.1 and 41.1.2 of our Irish Constitution, which read respectively as follows. 41.1.1 The state recognises the family as the natural, primary and fundamental unit group of society and as a moral institution possessing inalienable and imprescriptible rights antecedent and superior to all positive law. 4112. The state therefore guarantees to protect the family in its constitution and authority as the necessary basis of social order and as indispensable to the welfare of the nation state. There is wealth in Ireland, but it will not be found among average families struggling to maintain a home. There are, however, six individuals listed as Irish billionaires whose personal fortunes range from 1.6 billion to 12.5 billion. That's a combined fortune of 30.7 billion, or on average, 5.11 billion each. In late 2014, the Irish Times reported the existence of 90,000 millionaires in Ireland. That's equivalent to the entire population of the Kilkenny area. There is no question that alternative focus for taxation could have gone on unproductive land use, that is, hoarded land, instead of targeting the family home. The spectrum of VAT taxes could have been marginally adjusted upwards to facilitate additional revenue. Levies could have been placed on the purchase of wealth statement luxury cars, for example. But no, the focus was placed instead on the low-hanging fruit of family homes. Was this fair or just? I think by now you're probably beginning to get the idea. It was absolutely unfair, unjust and an undermining of the family. Reason 12. Family home tax was debated for all of ten minutes in Dáil Éireann before being guillotined into law. Ah yes, the guillotine. I'm sure French aristocrat Marie Antoinette understood exactly what the guillotine was. But guillotines in Ireland? Well, in Irish government context, the term could be described as a mechanism for chopping off debate, stopping official political dissent in its tracks, silencing parliamentary opposition. In a late 2013 article on the Irish Political Forum, Owen O'Malley states as follows, It is clear government use of guillotines to limit debate on legislation is and has been excessive in Ireland. In most other European countries, guillotines are limited to emergency legislation or used for when there are a few limits on speaking time in debates. So, in the context of something which was going to have a profound and long-lasting negative impact upon the security of the family home, was such deliberately curtailed debate either fair or just? I suspect that I know your likely answer to that. Reason 13. Family home tax is not linked in any realistic way to the provision of local services. A myth of that nature was spun to justify its introduction. In a January 2014 article in the Irish Examiner by Sean Connolly, the then Minister for Finance, Michael Noonan, is quoted as saying a subvention was being made from the local government fund to the water metering company. Unquote. In other words, 490 million from family home tax, a.k.a. LPT property tax, was being handed to Irish Water, an entity being primed for eventual privatisation and a mechanism for laying down a further layer of austerity taxes 
via additional water charges in the form of metered billing. So the proto-private entity Irish Water, which at creation had been handed 11.5 billions worth of public water infrastructure assets, was now also being further infused with 30% of family home tax. And this, while at the same time people in mortgage difficulty were having their homes repossessed. Fair and just, would you think? Perhaps in some alternative warped reality. Reason 14. Family home tax was necessary to prevent property bubbles. What has happened with the so-called property market in Dublin lately? OECD suggests a bubble is forming. Need for family home tax to prevent bubbles? Another myth exposed. In early 2016, a chart entitled Residential Property Prices in Dublin 2012-2015 was displayed on the internet site Goldcore. This is some of the comment which accompanied that chart. A property bubble is developing in the Dublin housing market, with residential property prices having surged by 50% on average and as much as 100% in more affluent areas since the Dublin property market began to bounce in 2012. Wrong, surely? Couldn't possibly be the case, because we now have family home tax, right? Wait, there's more. In an Irish Examiner article of the 8th of June 2017, Eamon Quinn quotes the Paris-based think tank OECD on property in Dublin as follows. The sharp rise in prices and lending raises concerns that another bubble may be forming, and the authorities should stand ready to tighten prudential regulations if needed. The report was published on the same day as the Central Statistics Office figures showed house price inflation had re-accelerated to an annual 10.5% in April. Supply will likely remain restricted for some time, warned OECD. Property prices are rising rapidly on the back of strong economic growth and a shortage of housing supply. Property-related loans are increasing fast, contributing significantly to the recent recovery in total new lending. Activity in the construction sector is gaining momentum but supply is expected to fall short of demand for some time, said the OECD. The central bank did not comment on the report. Similarly, Owen Burke Kennedy in the Irish Times on the 7th of July 2017 reported on OECD property bubble concerns, and I quote, In its latest economic outlook, the Paris-based group said Irish property prices were rising rapidly on the back of strong economic growth and a shortage of housing supply. At the same time, property-related loans were also increasing fast, contributing to a recovery in new lending. Again in the Irish Times on the 10th of June 2017, Owen Burke Kennedy reported as follows, and I quote, On Wednesday, the Fiscal Advisory Council cautions that a leap in construction to address pent-up demand in the housing market could overheat the economy, bidding up prices and wages, and undermining competitiveness in a throwback to the mid-2000s. The OECD then upped the ante by warning, as it famously did in 2006, that the Irish economy was already overheating, and that the sharp rise in house prices and property-related lending raised the prospect of another bubble. So, it was an acceptable function then of our so-called Just Society government to feed us the blatant lie that family home tax was essential to prevent property bubbles. No, it was as utterly unacceptable as family home tax itself. Reason 15 Family home tax mitigates against commitment to community, as it discourages home ownership. 
In a nutshell, any barrier, however small, which may be deliberately placed in the way of families being able to own and retain their home, is inherently not good for society. Some of the advantages of home ownership are as follows. Home ownership overcomes many of the disadvantages of renting. In particular, the owner-occupier has incentives to maintain the house in a better quality than the landlord. And where there are children in the household, they will probably have the benefits of a warmer, drier home. Home ownership is associated with positive effects on educational outcomes for children, with children of home owners more likely to stay in school than those of renters, which, when those children become adults, may translate into higher earnings in later life. Home owners are also more likely to invest time in community activities. Home ownership seems to confer both psychological and material advantages on owner-occupiers. And lastly, psychologically, owning a home rather than renting seems to confer greater autonomy. So, in a just society, where a constitution defines the family as the key institution of society and claims to protect that institution, could the likes of family home tax be seen as either just or fair? To my mind, neither would be the case. Reason 16. Family home tax causes worry and anxiety for retired people who are on low fixed pensions. Little further comment is required here, really, because this is such an obvious negative impact of family home tax. However, I would nonetheless say a family home remains a family home until, for whatever reason, a decision may have to be taken to surrender it. Retired parents are just as entitled as anyone else to the continuity of a secure home which they may have spent a working lifetime paying for, together with all previously associated taxes. It is unconscionable that any substantial and indiscriminate taxation should be parachuted into what for so many retired people is a financially vulnerable period in life. It is not appropriate that retired parents on low fixed pensions who may be lucky enough to have some small, modest lifetime savings, to have to drain away those savings in order to pay the likes of an annual and, relatively speaking, significant family home tax. Could this arrangement be interpreted as just or fair? Absolutely no way. Reason 17 Family home tax is wrong because the family home is not of itself a revenue or profit generating entity. The only point at which any market permitting financial gain may be made from a family home is possibly following its disposal. There are already robust capital gains and inheritance taxes in existence which permit the state to take substantially from the homeowner when, for whatever reason, the family home must be disposed of. So, we have massive mortgage length front end family home taxes, which we have already considered, and, as above, substantial back end family home taxes extracted at disposal of the home, and then since 2013, we have imposed between the two an indiscriminate annual family home tax called LPT property tax. Could the above be considered to be one of the hallmarks of a fair or a just society? Not a chance. Reason 18. The family home, once established, should never become a target for any direct taxation. Why? Because its purpose is to provide an affordable, secure and nurturing home from which 
future generations of taxpayers will likely emerge. We have already seen how in Ireland the family is considered under our constitution to be the key institution in our society and how the state is called upon under our constitution to support and not undermine the family. In these times of banksterism, financial vulturism, home repossessions and accelerating irreversible technical unemployment, all of which in their own right are massive threats to family security. Could the added imposition by the state in 2013 of family home tax be viewed as supporting the family? Clearly the answer to that has to be no. In any just society, and particularly in the likes of current times, such a proposal would have absolutely been discounted. Reason 19. Family home taxation in the form of domestic rates had been resoundingly rejected previously by the electorate. Yes, in 1978, direct annual taxation on family homes was finally and resoundingly rejected by the people. The abolition of what at that time was known as domestic rates was also supported by every Irish political party then in existence. If the Ireland of the 1970s and 80s, arguably a profoundly difficult economic time for our country, could survive on the alternative taxes brought in to replace domestic rates, which it did, then there was no good reason or justification, except for compensating bankster criminals that family homes of today should again find themselves a target for a heretofore rejected form of inappropriate and multiple penal taxation. Would your gut instinct tell you that allowing such an indiscriminate anti-family taxation to re-emerge was either just or appropriate? My instinct would certainly rail against the likes of it. Reason 20 public representatives of all parties and none previously and unanimously abolished domestic rates, an earlier incarnation of family home tax. Apologies for apparently repeating myself here as mention was made while we considered reason 19 of the support for domestic rates abolition by public representatives in 1978. It is worthy of note however at this point that for quite some time prior to the eventual abolition of domestic rates, a long and determined public campaign, particularly in Dublin, had been conducted in support of such abolition. The success of that campaign grew from its tenaciousness and the obvious financial hardship which ever-increasing domestic rates were imposing upon working families. There is, of course, no question that certain political parties of that time, in a strong enough position to so do, capitalised on the immense public opposition to domestic rates and used that opportunity in order to gain or maintain power. However, the same valid reasons and many more serious reasons exist today for the removal of penal annual tax from family homes as existed in the 1970s. Was it just or fair that annual family home tax was brought back in 2013? Only those who could well afford to pay any such tax and whose homes are under no threat whatsoever would likely suggest that bringing annual family home tax back was a just and a fair thing to do. Reason 21 Direct taxation on family homes is wrong because it has the potential to push families into further debt. Today, as is patently obvious, so many families have been forced into having to defend their homes. To any family, the home is sacrosanct. It is an indispensable refuge, a bastion, a place of protection and for many comfort. It stands to reason, therefore, that families will do all in their power, 
up to and including enduring the most severe financial strain in order to protect and defend their home. In April 2016, Stephen Rogers in the Irish Examiner reported Tom Healy of the Nevin Economic Institute as saying, and I quote, The trend in household debt since 2001 shows a pre-recession peak of 236% of net personal disposable income in 2007, up from 111% in 2001, which was probably well above the average in the previous decade. In simple terms, a representative, Pather and Elizabeth Murphy Smith, with a combined debt of 33,000 in 2001 and a combined income of 30,000, six years later their combined debt had jumped to say 120,000 euros while their income had risen to, say, only 50,000. Although wages and other costs were chasing to follow the property bubble, the total of personal debt was racing ahead at breakneck speed to reach some of the highest levels in the OECD world. Recent figures showed a return to dangerously high debt levels." Unquote. The well-known Irish charity St. Vincent de Paul at the end of 2016 stated, and I quote, We distributed 35 million last year. Demand is not slowing. We anticipate making 50,000 visits to homes before the end of this year. We're seeing no decrease in the numbers of calls. It is a vital time to raise funds and awareness of what is happening, unquote. At a time of such levels of personal debt and such essential accelerating charitable inputs into Irish society, is it right, proper or just that the family home should be a squeezed target for additional annual taxation? I suggest that the answer to that question can only be no. Reason 22 Family home tax is anti-home ownership because it increases the overall burden of running cost. Many family home owners, mortgage holders, who, prior to 2013, had, in a prudential way, financially undertaken the purchase of a home, suddenly found in 2013 that their family's home security had been undermined by a state re-imposition of a long since rejected, unfair, unjust, immoral and anti-family type taxation. From our consideration of the previous 23 reasons, we are now well aware of the many ways and varied ways in which family home tax, aka LPT property tax, is negatively impinging upon the security of the family home. The rising of the home running cost burden, therefore, is but an additional an unmistakable negative impact of current direct annual family home taxation. In the above context then, and taking into account the family home predation fest unfolding in Ireland right now and set to continue, could we consider the direct annual family home tax re-emergence to have been either just or fair? In the current top end middle and back end take 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 context absolutely not reason 23 in 1994 the finnegale party made the following statement residential property tax will not help to relieve the burden of taxation on income fast forward to 2011 and the arrival of a labor finnegale government who repeated ad nauseum 2011 through 2016 that they emphatically had not and would not increase income tax. Yet, like the discharge of a scattergun, they imposed a universal, indiscriminate 
ironclad family home tax, which, irrespective of one's financial circumstance, must be paid every year, under penalty of law, for default. Where must the money come from to pay the annual family home tax, aka LPT property tax, but from income? And income, I might add, which has already been taxed. PAYE, PRSI, USC, etc. Given the horrendous vulnerability of present-day Irish family home owners, mortgage holders, could such action by the state, a state sworn under its constitution to protect and support the family, be described as either honest, fair or just? I hardly imagine so. Reason 24. When the local authority allowance aspect finally and fully kicks in, family home tax will soar. Family home tax predecessor domestic rates increased relentlessly year on year. In regard to family home tax, I believe that we are currently, relatively speaking, existing in a calm before a storm. I have little doubt if our citizens had sheepishly accepted the additional taxation of metered domestic water charges, we would probably by now be paying a very much inflated annual family home tax. Cognizant of the significant citizen uprising vis-a-vis -vis additional water charges, the 2011-2016 Labour Fine Gael government decided to soft-pedal on their otherwise draconian plans for a quick expansion of family home tax. Amounts were frozen and a planned revaluation for 2016 was pushed back to 2019. Recent calls to Ireland from what I identify as the European corporate empire for increases in annual property taxes on the face of it do not bode well in the short term for struggling Irish family homeowners, mortgage holders. The vast majority of family homeowners in Ireland right now are probably paying family home tax, aka LPT property tax, in the hundreds of euros. Without delving into what the returns obtained are by communities in, for example, either Britain or France, in exchange for annual property tax payments. I note, however, that the average annual amounts paid in those countries are €1,441 Euro equivalent in Britain and €2,000 in France. Is it just or fair that the Sword of Damocles of a 2019 family home tax revaluation should be allowed to continue hanging over family homeowners or mortgage holders. To my mind, it certainly is neither. Reason 25. It was never a valid argument to suggest that simply because other countries had chosen to tax family homes that Ireland should blindly follow suit. When I say choose to tax family homes, I am referring specifically to recurring annual taxes as distinct from VAT on building materials, stamp duties, capital gains taxes and or inheritance taxes. So often in the lead up to the reintroduction in Ireland in 2013 of annual recurring family home tax, we were subjected to the hollow and nonsense argument that simply because other countries had annual recurring family home tax, such was also essential in Ireland. Nothing could have been further from the truth the reintroduction of recurring annual family home tax in Ireland was simply a political choice. It was a rapid-fire expediency, and the main excuse given was that we had to do so to appease the so-called Troika. Denmark, for example, a member of the EU, does not have recurring annual family home tax. It is also instructive to note that neither does Malta, another EU member state have annual recurring family home tax. However, in relation to the latter, there is at least one hard-pressed 
Irish billionaire living there, with whom by now hardly a single individual here in Ireland is unfamiliar. I have to leave his name redacted. So, was the direct targeting of family home tax in Ireland for recurring annual taxation just or fair? My answer must continue to be no. And finally, reason 26. A home is a family's castle. It should not be encumbered by any additional state costs bar its original purchase price, which already includes substantial taxations. In the context of a just society, post-purchase, the family home should never become a soft target for any additional taxations, direct or otherwise. If you have persevered in your viewing to this point, thank you for your patience and endurance. While the list of reasons is long, it is perhaps, at the same time, by no means exhaustive. Its existence is necessary in order to sketch in the proper background against which the implementation of family home tax, a.k.a. LPT property tax, in Ireland should have been considered. The list is simply indicative of aspects which would be carefully considered and accommodated in any just society prior to the introduction of the type of taxation we have been considering. Unfortunately, as we have learned earlier in this program, the reality of the annual recurring family home tax introduction in Ireland was ten minutes debate in the Dáil and the government guillotining into law. And so, in nearing the end of our journey, in considering but one element of what a just society in Ireland might look like, we need to reference the following present-day contemporary facts, while at the same time bearing in mind the very significant current triple-lock burden of taxation on Irish family homes. In an article in the Irish Times on the 27th of June 2017, headed Ireland has more multi-millionaires than Dubai, Peter Hamilton comments as follows, and I quote, Some 85 new ultra-high net worth individuals were created in Ireland in 2016, an increase of 6.4% on the year. The results rank Ireland in 24th place in the Wealth X report of 2017, which measures the global ultra-wealthy population and their total wealth. The ranking places Ireland higher than a number of countries, including Belgium, Thailand and the United Arab Emirates. An individual is classified as ultra-high net worth if they have 26.7 million euros. The ultra-high net worth population grew globally by 3.5% in 2016 and those individuals increased their wealth to $27 trillion. Unquote. Mark Keenan in the Irish Independent on the 26th of June 2017 comments on the Irish housing market as follows. And I quote, we threw it away. Measures introduced two and a half years ago by the central bank to curb runaway property inflation were only ever a temporary stopgap. The aim was to control prices, to buy time to enable the state to fast-track housing development in a market which is now seeing the worst supply levels in a lifetime. It was plenty of time. Two and a half years should have been more than enough to enable something to be done by government to increase housing stock and head off another property bubble. But despite the release of one housing plan after another in the interim, this has quite plainly not happened, even despite the considerable breeder bought on our behalf to amend the problem. Now, 
the pressure caused by ever tighter supply combined with newly moneyed buyers has seen prices inching up to levels which are once again heated and within the realms of those experienced in the Celtic Tiger years. More worrying is that today's inflation is running high, but also with the handbrake of those lending restrictions largely still applied. We have artificially put the brakes on prices by seeking deposits of 20% rather than a more normal 10%. And now the latest Irish Independent or EA survey shows that price increases are back up to boom era speed with these measures largely still in place. Relaxing that 20% deposit rate is just not an option now, even if it means that average Dublin buyers are now facing a completely unmanageable cash down payment of 83,000 euros if they want to buy the most average three bedroom semi in the capital, now priced at 414,500 euros. What young family could save 83,000 euros? Unquote. In the Irish Times on the 27th of June 2017, we get the following abstract from a report by Kira Kenny, who was looking at house hunting under an article heading, part of which is this The burnt out house has gone sale agreed. And I quote A for sale board has just gone up outside a house just a few doors down from hers but the listing wasn't yet online. Call them quick, she said. Get in there early, and you might have a good chance. Before hanging up, she mentioned the doors and windows were boarded up after the house went up in flames a few years ago. Anyone I've mentioned the house to since has been horrified by the thought of taking on a burnt-out shell, but the prospect excited us. It looked from Google Maps like the house had been empty for a long time, even before the blaze. We'd get this place for a bargain price, and with a lot of hard work, and a few hundred grand, we'd have saved on the purchase, we could transform it into our dream home. I called the estate agent's office to ask what it would be going for. Surely it couldn't be more than 150,000 euros. For a burnt out, two up, two down, ex-council house. After a bit of flitting around, the woman came back with the figure of 350,000 euros. I guffawed. Unquote. So there you have it. If anyone still harbours the slightest shred of doubt that the so-called Irish property market of today is not aggressively bubbling up, then they must be living in a detached state of altered reality. It is the most horrendous of times for families and for the lucky ones who may still be managing just about to hang on to their family homes, no doubt a life of stress almost beyond imagining. We are only three months away from a national budget. Today, 27th of June 2017, the journal.ie ran a poll asking the following question. Should the government reduce taxes? The introduction to the poll was accompanied by the following byline. Many economists believe that tax cuts are a bad idea. At the point at which I discovered the poll, 2,546 people had responded. 66% of people had indicated either yes or maybe. 57% had voted yes and 9% had voted maybe. I responded yes. If it was up to me, part of any tax reductions would take place within the realm of family home tax by comprehensively reviewing it again against a background of the 27 reasons we have considered earlier in this program. Why? Because we have a constitutional imperative in our commitment to the family to do so. So, what has our journey through this episode of Irish politics and politics taught us? Well, one, we learnt that 52 years ago, a visionary Irish politician named Declan Costello 
dreamed of a just society in Ireland, and crafted a policy within, of all places, the Fine Gael party, to give effect to that dream. 2. We learnt that, as leader of the Fine Gael party, one James Dillon rejected the dream of a just society for Ireland, in favour of privatisations and corporatism. 3. We learnt that the Labour Fine Gael government of 2011-2016 brought about at least 25 of the most draconian service cuts and tax increases in living memory. 4. We learnt that 64 billion of our taxes were handed over to bail out failed banks and that the impact for each person in Ireland was a staggering 13,000 nine hundred and fifty six euros five we learnt that the misery of the poor was being caused by our institutions charles darwin number six we learnt that austerity is a weapon of economic tyranny number seven we learnt that a new poor in ireland had been created and forced into homelessness and the use of soup kitchens, the likes of which have not been seen since famine times. 8. We learned that greed fueled banksterism and vulturism had been accommodated in Ireland, in preference to the accommodation and protection of Irish families and their homes, something which is tantamount to a repudiation of sections of our own constitution. 9. We learnt that 1 in 10 families are in trouble with their mortgage. 10. We learnt that in recent times 7,500 homes and apartments had already been repossessed. 11. We learnt that a massive arrears time bomb continues to exist in Irish mortgages. 12. We learnt that more than 37,484 Irish mortgages are in arrears of more than two years. 13. We learnt that 25,000 families are currently in line for family home repossessions. 14. We learnt that there exists at least 26 sound reasons why LPT property tax needs to be urgently re-examined. And finally, in the context of the state of today's Ireland, 15. We learned that family home tax, aka LPT local property tax, is an unjust, unfair, indiscriminate, immoral, and anti family tax imposition, which should be lifted from the family home. We must advocate at every opportunity for this. And finally, in a piece in the Irish Times on the 25th of May 2017, Mark Fitzgerald, son of former Fine Gael leader Gareth Fitzgerald, wrote, and I quote, At the age of 12 in 1969, I accompanied my parents to the retirement dinner of John A. Costello, as my father Gareth had that summer succeeded him as the local TD. I still remember Costello's powerful oratory that night as he departed the political stage declaring, put upon your banners the just society, that Fine Gael is not a Tory party. His speech was a ringing endorsement of the policies that his son Declan had succeeded in getting Fine Gael to adopt some four years earlier. Declan Costello's Just Society represented a rights-based, forward-looking commitment to justice and to the common good of all in Ireland, while nobody would ever want to see extraordinary charities such as St. Vincent de Paul disappear. We, as a nation, should not be dependent on such charities to do the work of government. In the 1966 presidential election, Tom O'Higgins articulated a path towards the just society, saying, We must open the doors of education and comfort 
to all those who have for so long been left without them, and do all that can be done to house people better, to educate people better, to bring solace to the old and the sick, so that we can truly take our place among the nations of the world. Unquote. Unfortunately, in recent times, it has been the people's harsh experience that neither Fine Gael, the Labour Party, nor for that matter Fianna Fáil, subscribe in any meaningful way to the paradigm of a just society for Ireland. Clearly, it is now up to other political parties and independents in Dáil Éireann, and in particular to the Irish Social Democrats, to pick up on the dream of a just society, and to work tirelessly together towards giving that noble dream effect. Without the slightest doubt, the visionary Irish politician Declan Costello was no polythick, and his great vision of a just society for Ireland was absolutely no polythick. I look forward with hope to a day when we can all stand proud and proclaim with confidence that our Irish nation has finally and really come of age upon a bedrock of a just society. If you are Irish, then the challenge starts with you. Are you up to it?